What's up, EWU crew? It's The Raven, here to share with you another shocking, interesting, or strange, but very true story. Today, we're looking at three photos with disturbing backstories. Before we get started, I'll warn you that the cases we're covering are disturbing, and they're only going to get more chilling as we go. Out of the three pictures we're looking at today, this is the one that you might have seen, but if you haven't, I'm certain that you've heard about the disaster that happened just moments after the picture was taken. Since the case is widely known, we're going to talk about some of the little-known facts I'm sure will surprise you. This picture is one that's filled with the excitement of a new adventure. It shows the crew of the STS-51L as they smile and wave to those who excitedly gather to watch. In fact, tons of people congregated around their TVs on January 28, 1986, eager to watch the historic moment. The mission itself was routine, the transportation of cargo and crew from Earth to orbit but it was also the final flight of the Space Shuttle Challenger. As you can see in the picture, five astronauts and two payload specialists made up the crew of seven. The crew included 37-year-old Krista McAuliffe, who was making history as the first civilian and teacher in space. McAuliffe was picked out of more than 11,000 other applicants to the NASA program. Someone you probably didn't know who was considered to join the Challenger crew was Big Bird. That's right, from Sesame Street. Big Bird was seriously considered to be on the shuttle, but the plan never went through. If it had, though, what happened next would have been even more traumatizing for the children watching across America. Everyone boarded the Challenger, and I think you know exactly what happened next. Almost all of us know the horrific fate of the Challenger on that final flight. The crew was cleared for their mission, and Commander Francis Scobie gave the now haunting command of Go Throttle Up. The mission seemed certain to succeed, especially because the shuttle had already completed nine successful missions. Seconds later, NASA heard one final message from the Challenger. Marked pilot Michael Smith, who was on his first space flight, only uttered the words, Uh oh, before all the electronic communication with the space shuttle was lost. Many people think that the crew of the Challenger had no idea that anything was wrong until it was too late, but Smith clearly did. Everyone on the ground was helpless to do anything. They stared up in horror. One second, the crowd was cheering at the feeling of the blast from the launch as the Challenger rose up into the sky. The next second, everyone was quiet. It took a few moments for people to realize what happened. NASA personnel caught on first, staring up with tears in their eyes. Mission Control managed to say, Obviously, a major malfunction has occurred. Only 73 seconds into the launch, the Challenger erupted into a huge ball of flames when it reached around 48,000 feet above the Earth's surface. On the ground, all anyone could see was huge plumes of white and flames above them. Understanding of what happened was slow, with most of the crowd frowning up into the sky. When people realized that the Challenger was coming back down, but in pieces, People started crying, screaming, covering their mouths in horror. Then someone asked what everyone was wondering. Where are they? And someone else responded, Dead. We've lost them. One of the greatest tragedies was the fact that almost all of the loved ones of the Challenger's crew were on the ground at the time of the launch, staring up and helpless as the shuttle broke into pieces right before their eyes. Especially tragic was that Krista McAuliffe's two children had been brought to the roof of the launch control center so that they could have the best view to see their mother make history. McAuliffe had taken her son's frog stuffy and her daughter's cross and chain in the shuttle with her for good luck. Nine-year-old Scott and six-year-old Carolyn McAuliffe would have seen the explosion with disturbing clarity, and they weren't the only children to watch from the ground as their parents horrifically died. The burning shuttle continued upwards for another 25 seconds before it eventually plummeted into the Atlantic. The wreckage then scattered over the ocean east of Florida. To all the shocked people watching, it looked like the Challenger exploded, and actually, that's one of the biggest misconceptions about the Challenger disaster. NASA called it an explosion, so did the media, so do many people in years after, and even I thought it exploded. But it didn't technically explode, so what actually happened? Well, it erupted in flames and broke into pieces. A seal in the shuttle's right solid fuel rocket booster, which was meant to prevent leaks from the tank, weakened in the frigid temperatures and failed. Then hot gas began pouring through the leak, collapsing the fuel tank and ripping it apart. Then it all burst into flames. The flood of liquid oxygen and hydrogen created the huge fireball that tore the Challenger into pieces over the heads of the horrified crowd. Another misconception is that when the Challenger erupted in flames and broke apart, everyone on board had been killed instantly. 
In fact, NASA had insisted that the crew died instantly, probably because the alternative was too horrible to consider. But sadly, it's the truth. In a report six months later, it was revealed that the crew cabin had actually remained intact as it ripped away from the rest of the shuttle. Because of this, the Challenger's crew had actually survived the initial breakup of the shuttle, despite what most people believe today. In March 1986, the remains of the crew cabin were found by Navy divers about 18 miles from the launch site in about 100 feet of water. Inside the crew cabin were the remains of the crew, and only some of them could be identified. Those who were were then given back to their families, and those who weren't were buried in a monument. But the deaths of the Challenger crew are probably way more horrifying than you may have thought. The shuttle ripping apart didn't have a force strong enough to kill or even seriously injure the crew. Instead, most were probably still alive when they started to fall. And not only that, but they were also probably conscious. The crew cabin had air packs, which contained several minutes of air for an emergency, and three of the air packs were opened in the wreckage, showing that at least some of the crew was conscious in the fall. The crew cabin fell at more than 200 miles per hour, and it's been theorized that the drop in pressure within the cabin maybe knocked the crew unconscious, so that they weren't awake when they tragically crashed into the water. But sadly, if this were true, the mid-deck floor of the space shuttle would have been torn up by the change in pressure, and it wasn't. Horrifyingly, it seems that the crew would have been aware of the last terrifying moments of their lives. The cabin hit the water's surface about 2 minutes and 45 seconds after the shuttle tore into pieces, and they could have known what was happening that whole time. Those almost 3 minutes would have been petrifying. For sure though, the impact with the ocean was unsurvivable as well, even if they had miraculously survived, which I was really sad to learn was essentially impossible. The shuttle doesn't have an escape hatch, so they wouldn't have been able to get out anyway. What most people don't know is that the crew of seven were the first Americans to die during a spaceflight since NASA began in 1958. Now, here's the scariest part of all. The disaster was predicted to happen. The night before the launch, five engineers told NASA to delay the mission because they knew the O-ring seals would fail in cold conditions, and the launch was set in the coldest place of any shuttle launch to date. One engineer, Bob Eberling, said to his wife that he thought the Challenger would blow up and he was tragically right. To this day, Eberling blames himself for what happened and thinks he could have done more to make people listen to him, but ultimately it wasn't his decision for the Challenger to still launch that day. The great misconception about the Challenger disaster is that a horrified crowd of millions all collectively watched as it happened live, but this wasn't the case at all. The launch was at 11.39 a.m. on a Tuesday, a time when many people were at work and not seated around the TV to watch the historic launch. As well, all of the main networks covering the launch cut away from the footage the moment the shuttle broke apart to spare viewers from witnessing the horror. Far less people actually saw the moment live than we usually think. Instead, most watched the shocking replays of the accident hours after it had happened. But even with this in mind, there was a horrifying twist. Because NASA had wanted to share the historic event with schools, so they set up satellite broadcasts onto TV sets and classrooms. This was mostly done because McAuliffe, a teacher, was part of the crew, and it meant that even though many people didn't see the Challenger go up in flames live, hundreds of school children did instead. A teacher, recalling the moment that she watched the live feed with her students on the small TV set, said that right after the explosion, all the kids went quiet unsure of what they just saw. And then they all started asking the same question. Were all those people on the shuttle dead? She had to tell them, yes. To this day, many of those who watched the disaster in school are still horrified about what they saw. When looking to explain the disaster, many people pointed to the pressure that NASA was under to complete the Challenger's mission. And this was true. There had been many delays, and they were looking to make up for some of the difficulties they had faced when trying to get their previous shuttle, the Columbia, back on the ground. After an investigation, it was ruled that NASA violated launch rules on purpose. It was too cold, and they knew about the O-ring seal's tendency to fail in low temperatures. But there was also a worry about the fuel. Despite all of this, they went ahead with the launch, which intentionally violated the rules. However, a few rumors went even further to actually point the blame on Ronald Reagan's White House. They believed that he demanded that the shuttle launch in time with his State of the Union speech, and because he wanted the space program to look successful, which it wouldn't if a launch was canceled. 
but there's no real evidence that there was direct pressure intentionally placed on them to hurry up with the launch and therefore rush them before they were ready. In fact, Reagan's State of the Union was postponed, the first time a president did this, just so he could address the Challenger accident. Reagan also formed a commission to determine the cause of the disaster, and he even appointed Neil Armstrong as a vice chairman and included Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, to help with the inquiry. A little known fact about the Challenger is that two pieces of the shuttle were found a decade after all the important pieces were recovered. The wreckage that was recovered was buried in an abandoned Minuteman missile silo near Cape Canaveral Air Station. But most of the spacecraft remained in the Atlantic Ocean, about 50% of it since it was too costly and difficult to remove, and there was always a chance that pieces could wash ashore, and that's exactly what happened. In 1996, 20 miles south of the Kennedy Space Center on Cocoa Beach, two barnacle-encrusted pieces of the shuttle were found by someone walking along the sand. NASA engineers figured out that the larger piece came from the Challenger's left inboard wing flap, which helped to steer the orbiter during entry and landing, and that the second piece had probably broken off the bigger one. This was a pretty surprising discovery, because no one expected any parts of the shuttle to make it more than a dozen miles from the sea to shore. The Challenger disaster is the main reason that all plans to allow civilians into space were stopped for two decades, which frankly was probably for the best, because I don't think I would be signing up to get on a shuttle after watching seven people die in such a horrific way. One final little known fact is that crew member Ellison Onizuka brought his daughter's soccer ball with him on the mission, and even though he didn't survive, the ball was amazingly recovered from the Challenger wreckage intact. It was put into a memorial for Onizuka until three decades later when the ball was taken by another astronaut up to the International Space Station, which I thought was a fitting way to bring the tragedy full circle. Our second picture today is one that you could find on any social media account, which makes the story behind it all the more chilling. The Ruby family from Duncan, Oklahoma was a newspaper family. John and his wife Joy Tinker worked together at the Marlowe Review where John was the publisher. They had a son and daughter together, Catherine and Alan. Catherine was 17 in 2014 and 19-year-old Alan attended the University of Oklahoma. The family was unassuming and normal, probably just like my family and yours, not the type that you would ever think something tragic could happen to, but then it did. On October 13, 2014, the Ruby's longtime housekeeper, Rosemary Chavez, showed up at their house around 8.30 a.m. and found the home eerily quiet. What she didn't know was that John's co-workers were already a bit worried about him because uncharacteristically he hadn't shown up to work on Friday and he missed the weekly high school football game, which he always went to. These were hints that something sinister had happened, but no one really suspected anything. Carefully going through the house, the housekeeper noticed that all of the cabinets were open and that the dog's food bowls were overfilled. Going into the kitchen, she saw a pair of feet, Catherine's feet, and then John lying face down in the doorway. She also found Tinker lying cold and unresponsive further in the kitchen. All three had been shot to death. Completely distraught at finding the family she knew so well murdered in their own home, she made a harrowing call to 911. The police were quick to arrive on the scene and tape off the house while the Ruby's neighbors flooded into the street to see what was going on. Many of them were especially upset to learn that it had been the Ruby's who were killed, as they were known in the community to be great neighbors and a kind family. As news spread about the horrific death of the three Ruby's, so did the rumor that maybe they had been killed in a robbery that went very, very wrong. The police believed that the crime scene had possibly been staged to look like a robbery but the idea still terrified the entire community who worried about who would be next. This theory would turn out to be completely wrong, but no one knew that yet, and they also didn't know some of the seriously surprising twists and turns this case would take. And one of the weirdest coincidences that I've heard, especially since it really was just a coincidence, Alan Ruby was arrested only a few hours after his family were found dead. But the charge had absolutely nothing to do with his family. All the way back in January, Alan had pled guilty to credit card theft after he had stolen his own grandmother's credit card from her. He had been put into a delayed sentencing program and placed on probation. As part of this, he was fined $1,500, had to pay $5,980 in restitution, and even complete a cognitive behavior program which was meant to fix his behavior. But as we keep going, I think you'll agree with me that it didn't work. 
The case is a little more complicated than him just taking his grandmother's credit card and using it though. Alan actually opened a credit card in his grandmother's name, which is more than stealing, it's fraud. He was also charged with possessing stolen checks in a related crime. At this point, the local police were investigating him for forging checks worth about $17,500 since August. He was sentenced to three years in prison for the fraud charge, but this was just the beginning. Back on October 9th, only four days before his death, John had realized that his 9mm semi-automatic handgun was missing when he was headed to work. He kept it in the console of his truck, and he immediately told the police. He also told them that he thought it had been taken that morning. He didn't know it, of course, but it had actually been his son Alan who stole the gun from his truck. And Alan knew exactly what he was going to do with the gun. The same day that John noticed his gun was gone, Alan showed up at the house. It was around 8 p.m. when he confronted his mother where she was in the kitchen. He shot her right in the neck, but miraculously, the bullet didn't kill her, though she fell to the ground. Seeing that his mother was still alive, Alan raised the gun again and shot her a second time, this time aiming at her head so that the bullet would kill her. Catherine was outside washing her car at the time, but she came rushing into the house through the front door and then into the kitchen. Had she heard gunshots? Did she see her mother lying on the ground? I don't know for sure, and we won't know because Alan shot her in the head, immediately killing her. I found this next detail really disturbing to imagine, because after killing his mother and sister, Alan waited in the house with their bodies for his dad to come home. I think what I found so chilling about this was that sometimes it's easier to imagine crimes happening in the heat of the moment when someone reacts more than they think. But not only did Alan plan his family's deaths when he stole the gun, he then patiently waited for about an hour for his father to come home so he could complete the job. When John finally came home, Alan struck, shooting him almost the exact same way he had killed his mother, first by shooting him in the neck and then the head when he hit the ground. After everyone was dead, Alan still didn't flee the scene right away. He took the time to take the DVD disc from the house's security system and then left. He carefully disposed of the DVD and the gun by throwing them both into a lake. When he drove back to his dorm room from the lake, he grabbed his cell phone, which he had left on purpose so that it would be evidence that he was in the dorm at the time of his family's deaths, and so that it wouldn't ping off any cell phone towers near the Ruby home. To add to this, he also made a post on social media saying that he was at his dorm on that night. Alan had clearly planned his crime. He thought of almost everything. As if nothing had happened at all, Alan then left the state of Oklahoma. Not to run away and flee the crime as you might be assuming, no. Instead, he went to a University of Oklahoma versus Texas game in Dallas. There he stayed in the fancy Ritz-Carlton Hotel and partied the whole weekend. He took this picture of his friends at the hotel and posted it. You can see the girl smiling, clearly with no idea about what Alan had just done to his whole family. Alan didn't even go to the game, instead spending his time at the bars. His friends who were with him later said that over the weekend, he was happy and laughing and having a good time, and never did anything to make them suspect anything. To me, this not only shows that Alan wasn't really battling with his conscience after killing his family, but also that he was extremely confident he wouldn't get caught. So, how was he caught? Well, when police were first examining the Ruby family deaths, they asked Alan to come to the house to help with the investigation. At first, he seemed really distressed when he was told that his family had been killed. But when he was at the house, the police thought he was acting really strange and said that he was cold and callous, despite having just lost his parents and sister. He apparently didn't ask investigators many questions about what had happened and was very nonchalant about the whole thing. Police suspicions were raised and they brought him in to be interviewed after he had just been arrested on the fraud charge. While there, Alan soon confessed to stealing his father's gun and killing his family only one day after their bodies were found. Unsurprisingly, Alan was then charged with three counts of first-degree murder. He told the investigators the exact story that I told you. He shot his mother, sister, and father before throwing the gun and DVD from the surveillance system into a lake to get rid of the evidence, but only part of that story was true. You see, Alan had clearly planned this crime and thought it through quite a bit, so when he told the police that he got rid of the gun and DVD, it was a lie. That's not what he did at all. Why did he lie? Maybe he thought to himself, if I lie, then I keep the evidence that would actually tie me to the crime hidden. Maybe he thought, if they can't find the evidence, then I get a lesser sentence. Or maybe he thought they wouldn't be able to prove it at all. Either way, it didn't work. 
Allen must not have expected the police to find the storage unit he had, but they did. There was surveillance of him driving to the storage buildings just after his family had been shot. Inside his unit, the police found the missing 9mm gun believed to be the one used in the shooting, and the surveillance tape from the Ruby's home as well as blue nitro gloves that they believe he wore when committing the crime. They also found a bunch of other things that Allen had taken from his family's house, including his mother's purse, her checks, deposit slips, and credit cards, two of the computers, an iPad, an iPad mini, and a box filled with prescription medication. On his way to Dallas, Allen had tried to discard the clothing that he wore when shooting his family by throwing the evidence on the side of the road. But why did he do it? It's the question I always find myself asking, especially with a 19-year-old killer. Why would he kill his own family in such a cold-blooded way? Well, apparently Allen would go on huge spending frenzies and often enjoyed showing off to the people he met in university that he was quite wealthy. He especially enjoyed the fact that other people were drawn to him because of his Rolex watch and the Louis Vuitton shoes he wore. Allen would even go so far as to tag his own social media posts, hashtag expensive. When his parents paid for him to take a trip to Paris, he ended up spending more than $5,000. His parents had actually gone to the police over this because they thought Allen was using a credit card that didn't belong to him, and this was the beginning of the stolen credit card charge because it was his grandmother's that he was using. Later, it was believed that he had also stolen one of his mother's credit cards, or if he hadn't, he started one in her name without her permission. But all the money he recklessly spent wasn't his, it was his family's. They already had an incident two years earlier when Alan and his mother got into such a bad argument over money that he apparently assaulted her. At the end of their rope and not knowing what else to do, his parents decided that he needed to be completely financially cut off because he was just too reckless. It's pretty clear that someone who enjoyed flaunting money so much that they would tweet making fun of people who ate ramen noodles would be upset about losing their ability to frivolously spend money. But it wasn't just his anger about being cut off that led Allen to shoot his family. Apparently, Allen told the police that he owed about $3,000 to a loan shark, and he thought that if his family all died, he would inherit all of their money. Not only would this solve his problems with paying back a loan shark, but he would also have all the money that he wanted to spend, and no one to tell him he couldn't. His father had two life insurance policies worth a total of $20,000 that would have gone to his wife if he died and then been split between the two siblings if their parents died. Was this the sum that Alan had killed for? When he was at court for the triple homicide, Alan looked like a timid, scared teen. When he spoke, his voice was often so quiet that it was hard to hear him, and he visibly shook, neither of which really fit the image I had in my head of someone who would be outraged enough about money to kill their parents and sister. Allen often cried in front of investigators and the judge, but the prosecutor said that the show of emotion was crocodile tears, and the only thing he was remorseful about was the fact that his life is basically over. This was pretty much confirmed when he never actually apologized for killing his parents and sister in court. He did, however, admit to being a shopaholic, which I thought was a big understatement. Part of the testimony given was by the housekeeper, Chavez, who found the Ruby's bodies. She gave a tearful description of the horrific discovery, but also added in something really interesting. Chavez said that a month before she was killed, Alan's teenage sister Catherine was crying about him being up to his old tricks again, probably referring to his spending. She was crying so much that Chavez tried to comfort her, but Catherine said that she'd been told about some of the things Alan was saying to his friends, including that he was going to end up killing them, something that is pretty hard to comfort someone about. During his trial, the insurance company actually petitioned the judge to rule that Allen wasn't entitled to receive the policy funds, which makes perfect sense. It currently hasn't been publicly released if the judge disqualified Allen from receiving their insurance money, but it seems like it would be quite unlikely that he would be allowed to receive it, especially if he was convicted of the murder. There was something that really bothered me about this whole case, not just that Alan had killed his family, which was of course disturbing, but there was something else, and I think it really shows another level to what Alan did. It all goes back to the fraud charge. All the way back in January, Alan knew that he had an upcoming fraud charge for opening a credit card in his grandmother's name. Sure, he didn't know the outcome of the sentence he would be given, but he had pled guilty, so he had to know that he would be facing some jail time at least. He had a few months of freedom before he was sentenced, but he knew it was coming, 
And yet, right before his sentence came, he decided to kill his whole family so he could inherit their money. But he had to know he would be going to prison soon. So what was the point? Did he really think he wouldn't go to prison for fraud and therefore he would be able to do whatever he wanted with his family's money? Did he forget about the charge and become so obsessed with being cut off that he didn't even realize it was almost pointless to kill his family since he would be in jail for at least a few years before he could use the money? Or did he think of all of this and kill his family anyway rather than wait until after he was in the clear of the fraud charge? It just doesn't make much sense to me. Allen was eventually sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, a fitting in for someone so obsessed with money. And oddly, Allen seems to agree. He later wrote a letter from prison where he actually says he deserves to get the death penalty for his unspeakable crime and that his remorse over what he did is genuine. The letter even says, the tears have all been real. I lost my entire family at once. How could they not be real? He never got the death penalty though, as he had taken a plea deal and agreed to no parole and that he wouldn't appeal. Part of this letter left me wondering, Alan simply says that he didn't feel like himself that day, the day he killed his family, and I wish he would have explained more about what he meant, but I don't think we will ever know. One thing that I found so interesting about this case was that a part of the plea deal was an agreement that Alan wouldn't be able to profit from his crimes at all, that he couldn't talk to the media, and that he isn't allowed to make any book or movies about his crime. Now this, I think, is true justice that really fits his crime, as it was greed that motivated him, and now he can never get any spotlight or money for what he did. Before we get into the last picture, I must warn you that the story behind it is very disturbing, and it's the one I found the most haunting of all. In 2016, 17-year-old Russian girls Alina Orlova and her friend Olyana Sobchenko were students living in the city of Khabarovsk in southeastern Russia when they started adopting unwanted animals. Around this same time in the summer, people apparently also reported that stray dogs started disappearing. Maybe the two events were related, maybe not, but it seems to be a big coincidence. The two young girls promised to look after the animals they adopted and even took a series of pictures with them. One of the pictures shows a cute puppy wrapped up in a pink flowery blanket and Alina holding the dog up near her mouth where she's making a face and pretending to bite it. Another picture shows a different dog, a little older than the first, and one of the girl's hands making a half heart over the dog. It's the kind of cute thing someone would do if they actually cared about the animal, which makes it all the more upsetting. Olyona and Alina often enjoy dressing up with horror movie styled makeup, which this picture shows. They like creating scary looks with black and red eyeliner, exaggerated lipstick, and creepy contact lenses. But eventually, they decided to take their interest in horror movies into the real world in the most gruesome way. The two took videos and pictures of themselves giving into their bloodlust, one of which shows them smiling and posed with a nail and a hammer. Then they took even more pictures as they killed some of the same dogs that they had adopted and promised to take care of. I won't go into too many details about what exactly the teenagers did because it'll definitely turn your stomach and possibly cause you to hurl your computer across the room, preventing you from hearing the rest of this story. But there is one extremely disturbing picture of the same dog in the half-heart hand photo where it looks like it's meant to mimic a crucifixion. Some of the other pictures show animals after they have been killed. One of the final pictures shows one of the girls posing with a bloody apron on and her hands covered in blood, having obviously just finished their extremely disturbing crime. Later, it was revealed to be Alina because even though the picture doesn't actually have her face in it, it shows a distinctive arm tattoo which belongs to Alina. This would later become really important. The craziest part of the crime was that Alina and Oyana then took all of these extremely disturbing pictures and videos and posted them publicly online for everyone to see. Apparently, both of the girls were part of a social media where members would post pictures of animals after they'd been killed. People who weren't part of the sinister social media group were understandably horrified at what they saw and called attention to the local residents living near the girls. Their shocked neighbors quickly started a petition to the local authorities to have the girls stopped and arrested for the crime, especially since the girls just made another social media post about their plan to shoot, chop, and slice their next animal victims. The local media reported that Alina became worried she would be arrested for her horrifying videos, and so she tried to flee her hometown before she was caught. 
Luckily, she didn't get too far and was arrested at the airport of Vladivostok just before she could board a connecting flight to St. Petersburg. She was then put under house arrest where she stayed until her court case. I was shocked to learn that just before her arrest, Alina said that she planned on killing her own mother, and so it seemed like her arrest was just in time to avoid another tragedy. She even went as far as to ask people online just how long she would have to spend in prison if she was caught after killing her. Posting the graphic evidence of their crime, it was impossible for them to deny, but that's exactly what Alina tried to do at first. Even though she was seen in the pictures with the dogs before they died, and even holding a hammer, she said she wasn't involved. In fact, she turned to social media to proclaim her innocence, writing, I would like to speak in my defense. I do not know who has put this stuff to the internet. It is not the first time somebody wants to frame me, but I did not kill anyone and do not intend to kill. She also claimed that all of her social media accounts had been hacked, which is how the pictures were posted and that the images were fake. As news of this shocking case spread, people shared their horror with comments like, somebody should do the same to them in the same manner they treat these animals, or how can their mothers defend it? I would have probably reported on my child if he did something like that. Horrible. When the case was first filed in 2016, it seemed to be pretty straightforward. But when it went to court a few years later, it became even more complicated. And this was where it gets really interesting. It has been alleged that when Oyana Sevchenko was first arrested, she apparently referred to herself as the Devil's Duchess. Part of this claim to the strange nickname was another picture that she posted. It seems like they posted everything online, but this one was especially gruesome because it showed Olyana holding the heart of a puppy that had just been killed. She captioned the picture, it's for you Anubis, referencing the Egyptian god of the dead. This picture was obviously just one of the many gruesome ones she posted, including others that showed her clothes with blood spread all over them. Olyana apparently told investigators that the reason her clothes were all bloody in these pictures was because she needed to be constantly covered in blood to feel warmth. Pretty strange, right? Looking at the way that the girls shared their crime publicly and also added in wild claims like this really made me think that they were doing it to be as outrageous as possible so they could get as much attention as possible. There's nothing else to gain from these crimes otherwise, no motive that makes any sense, except a level of cruelty I could never understand. Or is there? The activist thinks there's a chance the photos were meant to be sold. This would point to a different motive, though they could have had multiple motives. Maybe the girls did this horrible act for money and also to gain notoriety. The activist brought up the theory to the police for them to investigate, though she isn't sure that they did, and from what I could find, it isn't clear if this was ever anything more than speculation. Either way, it wasn't a theory that crossed my mind. As their crimes gained more and more publicity, people started to speculate that they were actually part of a satanic gang, rather than just two twisted teenagers. This theory was fueled by Eliana's claim that at least one of the dog's deaths was a sacrifice to an Egyptian god. She was seen wearing a shirt that apparently had a Satanist symbol on it, which added to the speculation. Of course, the girls were charged with killing and hurting dozens of cats and dogs, but they were also charged in connection with a completely different crime entirely. They were both charged with a separate allegation of armed robbery over an incident that involved an alleged attack on a woman with a bat and a pneumatic gun. Part of the evidence was video footage which shows Eliana bullying homeless people. Alyana was given the additional charge of insulting religious believers and inciting hatred, probably for her comments about sacrificing to an Egyptian god. In court, she was often called the ringleader of the group. Something that really struck me was how in court, Alyana always had a smile or a smirk on her face, and it made me think she didn't have any remorse, and that she didn't seem to be taking the trial seriously at all, but the rest of her country was taking it very seriously. In fact, the case was investigated by the Investigative Committee, which is known in Russia for being in charge of investigating the most serious cases in the country, which shows the severity of the crime. The outrage felt by those in the girls' community was also felt across the country and resulted in protests, which could be why the case was investigated by such a high-level committee. Another piece of evidence was the discovery of what was called a pet cemetery, hidden in one of the abandoned buildings probably an old hospital in their hometown. 
As well, the skull of a cat was actually found at one of the girls' houses, and both their computers and phones were taken in as evidence. The amount of evidence is pretty hard to deny. In that same conversation, Aliana refers to herself as a psychopath with a need for torture. She eventually pleaded guilty to all of the crimes and was sentenced to four years and three months in a penal colony. Though penal colonies are the most common type of prison in Russia, often in remote areas and involve some kind of compulsory work, they aren't the deadly forced labor of the infamous gulags. In comparison, Alina Orlova, who also pleaded guilty, was sentenced to three years and ten days in prison and cried when she heard. This is one of those cases where a motive just doesn't make any sense to me. There's no clear gain from such cruel and senseless crimes.